I'm delighted to be joined by Anya Berezow from Dunhill Financial, Rebecca Lamas from Democrats Abroad, and Mary Louise Sarasso from American Citizens Abroad. Thank you very much for joining all of you. So we're going to start with uh, Rebecca, who is going to do a, a short presentation on some of the benefits of or the value of US citizenship for Americans living abroad. Um, before I hand over, uh, please bear in mind that information presented is for general educational purposes only, and you should always seek your own personalized financial advice. We will be answering your questions at the end, so please add them in the Q&A pop up at the foot of your screen. Uh, as and when you think of them throughout the session, and we'll try to answer them all at the end. So without further ado, over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Hugo. You you covered my disclaimer as well, because uh, I'm not an accountant and uh, I can't give any kind of financial or tax advice. So this is my kind of a disclaimer on top of your disclaimer. <laughs> Um, so just a little bit about me. I say yours um, was a lot more thorough, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Covering all bases. Um, I am, uh, so the reason I'm giving this talk is I am, uh, so first off, I'm a volunteer. I'm not being paid uh, to be here, nor do I get paid by Democrats Abroad or anybody. Uh, I am a, a volunteer for Democrats Abroad uh, as the chair of the Taxation Task Force. Uh, additionally, I am a volunteer uh, as uh, on the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel. Uh, I'm the international member of that panel. It's a, a federal advisory committee of the IRS. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to explain like who I am and what I am, why I am I am doing this. Uh, basically, I am a, kind of a similar position to a lot of you in terms of I've lived abroad for a long time. I'm a small business owner, and I basically got involved in order to change the system because I was frustrated with how, how it is. So um, just a little bit about Democrats Abroad as an organization. Um, just overall, we have what are called country committees all over the world where we have groups of volunteers working together in order to get out the vote in election years. We're obviously in an off year this year, but uh, we are officially part of the Democratic Party in the US. So we have a little bit of sway in that respect. Um, just diving kind of right into it. Um, the, the U.S. isn't like the rest of the world in particular because of our citizenship-based tax system that we have. Uh, I'm going to assume a lot of people here or are already aware of that. I don't think that you would be attending a session with this title if you didn't already know about the different kind of issues that Americans abroad experience with financial access and, um, and taxes. And um, most Americans abroad uh, usually live in a higher tax jurisdiction compared to the U.S., and um, this is something that I think uh, people in Congress uh, in particular struggle with. We really suffer from outdated stereotypes from tax writers um, and uh, legislators in Washington, D.C., where they think that we're just rich fleeing the country to evade taxes, and that's definitely not the case. Um, and the, the real core of the issue is that Congress doesn't think about us, and because they don't also hear from us, how would they know that there is an ongoing problem? But I really wanted to talk a lot about the changes that are coming and to, to bring you hope, uh, and hopefully I will uh, compel you in, in that way. But uh, just so uh, I... I I'm guessing probably a lot of people here know already, but this is a list of kind of common tax forms for Americans abroad. And uh, on the right hand side, you'll see a list of the average taxpayer burden that's estimated how long it takes to complete each of these forms for um, by the IRS. And you'll see that the kind of common forms at the bottom here are exceeding 50 hours. The one at the bottom, the 5471 is actually for American business owners. And uh, I mean, completing a a form that has uh, takes over 100 hours to complete is just absolutely insane. Um, on the other hand, we also have pressure from wrong, bad, misleading, scaremongering, predatory information that you're getting from um, the the tax compliance industry. Uh, one of my biggest bugbears is that in particular Moody's, um, they send out these emails saying, oh, it woes me. This is really, really hard. Is it really worth keeping your citizenship? And uh, it's, it's, this is really 
uh, predatory behavior um, because of the way that they're advertising to people outside of the United States is very difficult for uh, advertising agencies and any kind of regulations to be applied to these uh, companies. And uh, so there's little regulation in these kind of predatory advertising practices. So I think a lot of people more often than not are really driven to thinking about renouncing because they're getting all of this messaging. And, the, and really what happens with online and algorithms and everything is you start typing in tax and then you start getting ads for it and then it starts leading you down this kind of path of of where it feels like it's a path of no return but this is all just the algorithm feeding you information and it's really something I wanted to point out so people are aware um so the really I'm not gonna beat around the bush here it it's bad uh, you know, it 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 feels bad too. And I'm also not going to sit here and go through a list of reasons why you should keep your American citizenship. Um, I'm, I'm telling you to keep your American citizenship because you should have a right to keep your American citizenship. And really at the end of the day, most of the people I talk to don't actually want to renounce. But U.S. laws that have been written without even thinking about the impact it will have um, really harms us. And uh, simply because Congress doesn't hear from us is the reason why the way things are. Um, and it also equally, Congress doesn't hear from us. So how are they supposed to know there's a problem that needs to be fixed? And I've also met many people who have renounced and are very, very, very bitter that they felt forced into it. And at the end of the day, I, I do this voluntary work to prevent people from having to renounce. Once you renounce, you give up your right to vote in U.S. elections, which really is the strongest power you have to compel Congress to take action on these issues. And renouncing isn't an immediate out either. There are still a lot of consequences that experts speaking during this conference this week will be able to explain better than I can. But renouncing isn't this immediate out that gives you peace of mind as much as the scaremongering and predatory companies uh, would, would like you to believe. So at the end of the day, you do have rights. It is difficult to comply with filing a tax return and opening a bank account and doing a lot of different things that you should have a right to be able to do. But I'm going to talk about the different ways that you can actually navigate through the current system because there is hope. Um, and I'm not saying it e it's easy, but it is possible. So for example, there is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. A lot of people I speak to abroad, I didn't even know that there was a Taxpayer Bill of Rights until last year. Um, and, and this is the kind of like list of all of the, the items that are uh, that you have a right to. You know, you have a right to challenge the IRS's position and to be heard. You have a right to confidentiality. And, and the one that really gets me at the bottom of this list here is a fair and just tax system, which it really isn't. But that is why there is different and federal advisory committees that exist in order to hold the IRS to account. And equally, that's why there are various Americans abroad organizations like Democrats abroad who are working on behalf of Americans abroad in order to change the tax laws. Um, there is the Taxpayer Advocate Service. So this is actually a resource. It doesn't matter what income level you have. It is a free available resource to assist taxpayers to resolve tax problems with the IRS. They can open up a case for you and they liaise with the IRS on your behalf. Um, they're a really, really, really great resource. And I would really strongly recommend if you haven't heard of them before to go and check out their website because they have a lot of really good information on there. Um, Additionally, I mentioned earlier about my role on the taxpayer advocacy panel. So basically, uh, the panel is um, a federal advisory committee that was established by the Department of the Treasury. And basically, there is uh, at least one representative on the panel from each of the 50 states um, and also one for uh, international taxpayers. And basically, I am the international member of uh, TAP is the acronym. So. Um, the IRS has made a commitment to listen to the ideas of TAP members, and essentially we work on issues, we submit recommendations to make improvements to customer service and systemic issues in order to improve the, the 
service between taxpayers and the IRS. And I'm always, always open to hear from people about any kind of ideas that you have in order to improve uh, any kind of systemic issues or just, just to hear what your experience with the IRS has been or any ideas or recommendations to improve your experience with the IRS. Um, so the best way to do that is to submit a comment on the website uh, at improveirs.org. Uh, you can also drop me an email. And I've recently started a blog where I've written multiple different blog posts, which are actually getting a lot of traffic at the moment. The, the top one there is um, the 2023 online U.S. tax preparation software for Americans abroad that are free or cheap. Um, and I'm planning on writing a blog post a week during the tax season. So I'm, I'm hoping that that is a resource that will be helpful for people. In addition, for a year now, people have been able to get an online IRS account. Look, it's not perfect. Uh, there are a lot of bugs with it in terms of being able to, for people who don't have a U.S. address or a U.S. phone number to access it. But it is very possible. And lots of people I've talked to have been able to get one set up. Uh, it also doesn't really like allow you to communicate with IRS. It literally is just, it has copies of your tax previous tax returns, but at least you know what the IRS is holding on you. So there's that. And additionally, there are options. There are free cheap options that are available out there. There are a lot of different resources available in terms of lots of expat Facebook groups, um, Reddit groups as well. Um, and uh, blog posts and things like that online. If you do have a small budget, then you, you can look at getting an accountant. Um, there are also ways where, I mean, I've heard from people where they do it themselves and then they go to an accountant and the accountant, it's like the, checking their homework and it costs way less than having to spend a lot of money on an accountant. So uh, the cheapest ones in the market that I'm aware of are on the screen there as well. So I'm always open if people find new accountants or uh, people that are, are cheaper or like better options for navigating through the maze, like please drop me a line. I'd love to know like any additional ideas that I can then share out with other people. Um, additionally, a lot of people, if you're over 50, there is online free tax prep options with the AARP. You don't have to be an, a member with the AARP, uh, but you just have to be over 50 and it's only available between February and April, but it does exist um, and is an option. Uh, so just to kind of go into Democrats Abroad Tax Advocacy work. Basically, we're a group of volunteers and we're advocating for a switch to residency-based taxation, uh, which would ideally eliminate all of these problems that we experience. Also eliminating uh, the FATCA reporting of foreign accounts of Americans abroad so that Americans abroad don't have problems opening up bank accounts in the countries that they live in. And exempting American business owners living abroad from the guilty and transition tax. You can read more on our website there. Um, we are constantly um, engaging with, with members of Congress. For example, we have uh, submitted a statement for the record for congressional hearings and treasury regulations. Um, we do candidate outreach in election years. Uh, so engaging with people before they get elected on our issues so that they're aware. Um, we did a big report last year that was basically a survey of uh, the the report of a survey of over uh, of about 7000 Americans abroad and what you told us that you were experiencing. And we shared that report with members of Congress and we've been engaging with offices on on these issues in, in order to move the ball forward. Um, and uh, this is just a little bit more about the team. Like we were divided up into like congressional outreach, campaign outreach, um, policy and research, imp improving communications. But really, we still need more people. But really, at the at the end of the day, the only way things are going to change is if more people speak out. If more, if people remain silent on problems that they're experiencing, then things will never change. And, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of the time things have gotten worse is because we haven't been front and center. And I get that it's a lot harder for us because we're all abroad. We're not actually in Washington, D.C. or in the states where we can actually go to a, a congressional office and speak to people face to face. I'm very aware of those barriers, but it's not impossible. And we can accomplish more if we are working together. So if anybody is interested in helping out and getting involved, um, there's there's the link um, 
And for this year, really what we're doing is we're focusing on introducing one Americans Abroad bill that we will then push through uh, the House in particular. Um, we're also organizing to go to Washington, D.C. in June, and we're organizing a rally for residency-based taxation on June 15th, which is the expat tax um, filing deadline. And um, we're hoping to be able to be very, very visible to Congress in order to get them to really wake up and, and hear hear our voices and to pass legislation that will change things. Um, I, I just mentioned the report. There's a link to it. I really strongly recommend everybody here read it because it will let you know that you are not alone, that these issues aren't just you. They are from everybody abroad. Um, Another thing that you can do is to help share the report with your members of Congress, and there's three easy steps on the screen here, uh, and I'm sure I'll send out these slides after the event as well. Um, and if I didn't mention it before, I'll I'll say it again, your strongest voice is through your vote. Uh, you can, there are some key elections happening this year, not as many as, as last year, um, but there are some key elections. It can't hurt to register to vote anyway, just to see what comes up and what you're eligible to vote for. So you can do that at votefromabroad.org. Um, we also have some upcoming events in order to help Americans abroad. Uh, we run a lot of tax education webinars. A lot of it is, is that a lot of people abroad don't know that they're supposed to be filing. So when we don't have enough people that are educated, how are they supposed to have the language to articulate to Congress when there is a problem? So a lot of our tax education webinars are focused around that and educating people on what they can and can't do and what, what the inequalities are that exist. So um, you can sign up for our tax mailing list and we'll be announcing a lot of these tomorrow actually. So um, sign up for the mailing list and keep your eyes peeled for the email coming out. Um, Lastly, seven small actions you can take to help improve the tax system for Americans abroad. I already mentioned registering to vote and reading the tax report. Share the report with your members of Congress. Join Democrats abroad. It's completely free um, on our website. And you can also donate to our cause as well as sign up for our tax mailing list or, or volunteer. I kind of ranked those in terms of like least effort to like most effort, but hopefully that kind of like explains things. And I'm hoping that I'm I'm on time here. So so thank you so much for um, your attention. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Rebecca. That was uh, that was great. Lots and lots of information. Um, and I think that that point about voting um, is, is powerful. Um, is it a, a question, really? Is it possible? Do you have to vote where you last lived as an expat? Or can you change where you vote if you want to, for example, to vote strategically and feel your vote made more of a difference? Um, you're, you're supposed to vote based on where you last lived, but I know a lot of people who logistically that was a little difficult for them. So they've decided to vote from like their brother's house or, um, or, or something like that. So it, it does vary. Um, but you can, you can drop us a line. And if you're thinking of changing, we can kind of like talk you through the, 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 pros and cons and the logistics, because some states are more difficult to register to vote from abroad than others as well. So there's that to, to consider as well. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so moving on, um, I'm going to ask Anya to say uh, some words about financial benefits, so give a financial perspective on the benefits of being a US citizen abroad. Uh, just before I do, to introduce Anya, um, who is a um, expat financial advisor at Dunhill Financial. Um, which is a, a UK-based um, expat, expat financial advisory firm. Uh, with, but if uh, Dunhill clients are all around Europe um, as well as in the UK, so um, if you have questions for Anya afterwards um, uh, from a financial perspective, um, feel free. So Anya, I was hoping you might say a few words on the financial benefits of US citizenship for expats. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hugo, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, my experience as an expat advisor is definitely a lot of questions that clients come to us with, with renouncing citizenship, especially due to the tax tax burden, to, to Rebecca's point earlier. Um, however, I, what I want to talk about uh, are maybe little known benefits of holding on to your U.S. citizenship. Um, and there are two main ones that come to mind. So uh, first, 
is that most U.S. expats often don't realize that even without U.S. sourced earned income, they may be eligible for an IRA or Roth IRA contributions in the U.S. as long as they have foreign earned income and as long, of course, they meet certain criteria in, in regards to their U.S. Uh, tax filing status. So that's a huge um, uh, benefit, of course, especially for those that may be working in countries that don't have um, great pension schemes or, or any pension schemes, right, because we all want to be planning for the future, uh, saving for retirement. Um, but really, what is the benefit, right? S saving on, on a tax deferred basis in an IRA um, really um, gives you the benefit where you don't have to pay taxes on the growth of your investments until you take distributions. Or you can also save on tax-free basis, possibly within a Roth IRA. Um, uh, of course, that's as long as your country of residence doesn't tax Roth distribution. So it, it really depends. But overall, um, uh, keeping tax saving in mind could be very additive to your portfolio. You essentially get to keep more of what you earn, and that accelerates your savings, especially over, over long periods of time. Uh, so definitely important to keep in mind. Um, and while uh, for those of you that are wondering about the current contribution limits, while it is only 6,500 a year that you could possibly put into an IRA or 7,500 if you're over 50, um, every little bit counts, especially when it comes to tax savings. So that's definitely important. Don't forget about it. I meet a lot of people that don't even know that benefit exists and, and, and it is a big one. Um, the second benefit um, are investment costs in the U.S., um, from experience, what, what I can tell you with certainty is that um, U.S., when we look at U.S. platforms and cost of investing for U.S. citizens, U.S. is about 10 to 15 years ahead as far as the rest of the world, as far as financial services pricing is concerned. Um, as a U.S. person, you know, you've got access to, you're used to no trading fees, no platform fees, no upfront costs for investing. Uh, of course, with a disclosure that not all advisors in, in the U.S. abide by this, but most do. It's a very, very competitive land, landscape as far as financial services in the States. Um, but I, you know, that doesn't necessarily work like that if you don't have U.S. citizenship. Uh, we frequently meet with clients, U.S. clients that marry whose spouses are non-U.S. Um, uh, persons, and they only qualify for services, of course, outside of these platforms. And um, what, what they are seeing and what they're complaining about, because they've got a comparison between themselves and their U.S. spouse, is that they do have usually trading fees, platform fees, high uh, startup costs for even starting to invest. So uh, I would say competitive pricing uh, when it comes to investing is definitely a big benefit of, of U.S. citizenship. Um, those are, I guess, my two cents on uh, U.S. citizenship from a financial perspective. And, and those are two big benefits, I would say. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, so moving on to Mary Louise, um, who's uh, Mary Louise is from American Citizens Abroad. And it's going to tell us something about American citizen abroad, citizens abroad's work, um, addressing some of the challenges that uh, Americans living abroad face. Um, Mary Louise, do you want Thanks, to try uh, the slides? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Hugo. Thanks for having me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to present um, about our organization. A, well, actually, our two organizations, American Citizens Abroad and American Citizens Abroad Global Foundation. So just a little bit about me. I'm the executive director of ACA, and I have grown up living overseas and have lived overseas um, and continue to spend time, a lot of um, time overseas, but um, based here just outside, I live just outside Washington, DC, and ACA and ACAGF are headquartered in Washington, DC. So a little bit of background on the organization. We were founded um, <clears throat> 40 plus years ago in Geneva, Switzerland, because two of our founders that were working on the vote from a abroad issues and citizenship issues and representation in Congress actually lived overseas. A lot of people may not realize that 40 plus years ago, you were paying taxes when you lived overseas, but you actually were unable to vote. So um, a lot of individuals came together on that issue, not just ACA and not just people in, in Switzerland. And out of that grew um, the organization because we recognized that um, the information, the data, the frustrations, the problems were all coming from the community, but where you needed 
um, to fix things and where you needed to have awareness and a voice was in Washington, D.C. So we're nonpartisan, um, which is a really good thing for our organization because we have no skin in the game and we are able to walk into offices on both sides of the hall and obviously support efforts of um, the organizations like Rebecca's and and Republicans overseas that are also up on Capitol Hill advocating. So we are nonprofit um, and we are registered um, as a 501c4 for ACA Inc. and as a 501c3 for ACA Global Foundation. This is really important um, in, in offices up on Capitol Hill because it gives them a sense of comfort. They know the organization that they're working with. We, they know that we're qualified. They know in some respects that we are quote unquote legit because they get a lot of people knocking on their doors, um, you know, asking for meetings and, and um, it gives them a, a bit of comfort to know how an organization or, or the person representing um, the organization, how that organization is, is organized. So we actually have um, two branches. Um, ACA Inc. is the advocacy organization. I'm going to talk a lot about the work um, that ACA Inc. does. Um, we actually do the door knocking up on, on Capitol Hill. And then ACA Global Foundation is really the research and educational branch of um, ACA, and we do a lot of research work. I'll talk a little bit about um, the projects that we've done through ACA GF. Um, we recognized, we, we did a lot of our work through coming to Washington, D.C. and doing door knockers, and we recognized back in 2012 that we were coming to Washington, D.C. four or five times a year, and that really to have an impact, you had to have a regular presence in Washington, D.C. You had to be available in many respects to the Congress. Um, they like to be able to pick up the phone and, and know that you're there. It also really helps in terms of stakeholders, um, making the partnerships with other organizations that are working and advocating in Washington, D.C., um, it allows us to be involved in conferences and be able to get FaceTime with a lot of the people who up on Capitol Hill who are working on these issues, working on taxation. And an example of that um, would be a couple of weeks ago, I attended a DC bar conference, um, which I cross paths with a lot of the people um, that are in Congress working on legislation with the taxpayer advocate. Um, with um, people running other um, organizations, other stakeholders like the Center for Taxpayer Rights. Um, and that's really important because it gives you direct access to these people. It gives you face time with, the, with these people. So it's very important to have a presence um, and, and awareness in Washington, D.C. So um, I think Rebecca touched a little bit on uh, residence-based taxation. I think this is the um, the, the platform that all the organizations that are representing Americans overseas um, are advocating up to Congress to move from the current citizenship based taxation to residence based taxation. So to talk a little bit about that, what is residence based taxation? I know a lot of people out there um, and people on this conference are probably heard about it, but what does it mean? And in its purest form, it just means that it, your foreign sourced income is excluded from U.S. taxation. Um, as you know, right now, Americans are taxed on, on their income no matter where it's earned. So an RBT can't be done through regulatory fixes. There are regulatory fixes out there, um, and actually ACA has a, a regulatory fix that it advocates for on FATCA, but really to get to residence-based taxation, you need... Um, you need legislation. We would envision that a residence-based taxation um, legislation would allow for long-term expats to immediately qualify, people who have been overseas for, I'm not going to put a time frame on it, but um, we would hope that those people would all, all automatically be allowed um, to transition into RBT. And where um, where the Congress is going to be concerned, it's going to be concerned with newbies, people who want to get into RBT. Um, you might have heard out there in the community that it should be easy. Everyone should be able to do it. It can just be a turnstile. You're here one day, gone the next. 
that just is not going to happen um, up in Congress. That kind of legislation really opens the door to leakage, um, which is loss of revenue. And the Congress is going to be concerned about that, um, as all uh, as we all should be. Um, none of the organizations, I think, wants to advocate for any kind of legislation that in any way, shape or form can be um, in, interpreted as legislation that's allowing for um, for tax evasion. Um, we really strongly believe ACA that it should not RBT legislation should not cost the government anything. Um, this is the easiest way to get to legislation is not to have to ask anybody else to pay for it. Um, ACA went back a few years ago, can't even, can't even remember quite rent when, but I think it's about eight years ago. And we actually developed kind of what um, some in the organization call a vanilla approach, we call a roadmap, where we, ACA said, where in the current code do you need to go in, cut into that code to get to residence-based taxation? Um, it is not a piece of legislation, it is not even a proposal, but it certainly tells Congress, here's where the problems are, this is where you need to go into legislation and, and fix it. We actually went out through ACA GF we worked with a consultancy here called District Economics Group. They do a lot of cost analysis for a lot of legislation that comes, um, um, comes up in Congress. And we said to them, if legislation were written to carving into these current problematic areas of, of the tax code, can you get to revenue neutrality or can you get to zero, it costing zero. And we were able to do that. Um, we've had two runs at this um, research. I'll talk a little more about it. In 2017, we did a research project with um, District Economics Group, and then we updated that work in, in 2021. So how does RBT help all of um, you folks who are on this call who are living overseas? It obviously reduces and eliminates the burdensome filing. Um, you're uh, probably going to have to do some sort of attestation, but certainly you're not going to have the tax filing um, that is uh, associated with citizenship um, taxation. Uh, we believe that FBAR would continue to be in force. FBAR is not a tax filing form. It has everything to do with money laundering and um, terrorist financing. A uh, lot of discussion on whether that, that is really doing the trick but it is not a tax form. Um, foreign income, again, uh, both earned and unearned would not be subject to US taxation. Um, it would allow uh, Americans overseas to more easily in, invest in foreign financial instruments, more easily plan for their lives and, and retirement. Um, we believe that filing, FATCA filing for in-country accounts um, would uh, be eased. Um, it would also allow U.S. citizens to more easily compete um, on equal footing with foreign nationals for jobs. There'd be no longer this sort of tax um, uh, implication involved with um, having to no negotiate in, in salaries. And again, these are all things. There's no quote unquote legislation out there. These are all um, how we think RBT would help U.S. citizens overseas, but a lot would depend on how legislation is is um, is drafted. So what's really important and what's been really helpful up in offices up on Capitol Hill, and they've been very um, eager to hear from ACA and see are the ACA GF research results. Surprisingly, um, the IRS and Treasury, they have bits of information on the filing compliance of US citizens overseas, but they don't have a complete picture. ACA GF's research has been able to do this. We're the only private organization out there with this kind of um, research and data on the community. We have been able to estimate, unlike what the State Department um, says is this community size, that it's actually 5.2 million and 4 million of those are civilian. And those are the 4 million that are really affected by the um, citizenship-based taxation regime. So we find that 2.4 million of the 4 million are actually present on a tax return, actually compliant, and that perhaps 1.6 million don't appear. 
Uh, that looks like a big number. It looks like a frightening number. But as we know, and probably Rebecca uh, knows from her research, that this really is a lot of people who have misunderstood um, the foreign earned income exclusion. They've misunderstood foreign taxes. And they say, well, because of those thresholds and because I pay so many taxes in France, I would, you know, would not owe the U.S. government any, any tax revenue. So I simply am not going to file. Um, and obviously, um, our research still shows that you can get to zero um, cost to the U.S. Treasury. And it also shows that U.S. citizens remain invested in the U.S. There is a certain level of income that will remain taxable to the U.S. because it, uh, earnings and of, of income in the U.S. under an RBT would probably remain taxable. And that demographically, we're really not all that different. Than Americans living over uh, than Americans living domestically. We're pretty simply we're pretty pretty similar. We're not all that um, significantly more um, wealthy. So what um, what all of you who are on this um, on on this conference uh, webinar can do is you can join a campaign uh, that ACA is holding two campaigns that we're holding calling for hearings because we really really strongly believe that. There's no way that Congress can write legislation or regulations on any of these issues until they have a full understanding of the problems. ACA does a lot of this work by knocking on doors and educating congressional offices. And these campaigns are really helping us because we're able to see where groundswell of communications are going into one office and we're able to follow up. Oftentimes, constituents who have used these campaigns um, their offices will call ACA back. Um, so we really highly recommend joining these campaigns. What hearings will do is put on official record um, the problems that Americans overseas are having. And as um, we all know that a lot of times Congress is, is sorely unaware of, of what these problems are. I have, have to say, since um, we have, ACA has been present in ACA, um, and, and a lot of the other organizations have been doing good work um, up on the Hill. The awareness of these problems has really skyrocketed. There are really very few offices that I walk into that have not been aware um, or have not had, that's the wrong way to put it, have, have not had a constituent contact them um, or have zero awareness of the problems. Um, and a lot of that is due to FATCA, which I like to say is the gift that keeps on giving, because um, so many people were, have been affected by FATCA. So many Americans overseas have had their uh, bank accounts um, either, you know, canceled. They've been locked out of, of their uh, financial accounts. Um, so this really, uh, Congress has really heard a lot about this issue, especially um, for small businesses. So we continue to call for a regulatory um, uh, change to FATCA, a same country exemption, which would allow an American who is legitimately living in a foreign jurisdiction to exclude what are in country or his local accounts from FATCA reporting. This is not a replacement for residence-based taxation. This is simply a regulatory um, uh, provision that could be adopted by the U.S. Treasury that would go a long way to alleviate the problems of lockout um, and, um, and, and lack of, of you know, financial uh, access for Americans overseas. So why do research and testimony help? I mean, we hear a lot of times that somebody should just go and write this legislation. Again, um, the more you can put information into and up on Capitol Hill and into these offices, the better for us. You certainly don't want um, Congress writing legislation without understanding where all the problems are. That's kind of how we get into this, <laughs> into the continued problems is that um, we're band-aiding one thing without understanding the entire problem. So the research that ACA GF has done provides an enormous amount of, of knowledge to the IRS Treasury and Congress. We've been in all those offices, JCT, 
um, presenting this research. The submissions to Congress by our organization and other organizations, those are really important because they do present official record and they do keep um, focus on the problems and they keep the issues um, in, in the forefront. So it's really important. It also helps to get those issues into the media, having media support and articles written um, in particular in a publication called Tax Notes, which um, some of you may not be aware of tax notes and tax analysts, but that is the Bible for people up on, on Capitol Hill who are working on, on tax and regulatory reform. And if they see um, this topic um, highlighted, good, good rationale behind why a move towards residence-based taxation makes sense, that can only help our efforts. So you can all help by becoming members of ACA. Um, again, we're in Washington, D.C. I'm an Uber ride away from Capitol Hill. I'm often called up, up there. Um, you will get updates through your membership um, from um, our, all our advocacy work. Um, you can see other benefits to, to ACA. We have, um, as a member of ACA, you have the ability to apply for a U.S.-based based bank account, the State Department um, Federal Credit Union account. This has been a real lifesaver for a lot of Americans who have had their IRAs and 401ks either frozen. They've been able to roll them over into um, into SDFCU. So that is... Um, my presentation for today and happy to answer questions. Hopefully I haven't gone over my time. No, not at all. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, one thing, or a couple of questions about your presentation. One is, um, and a couple of people have mentioned Democrats abroad isn't here, is here, but not Republicans overseas. Um, and uh, the question is, isn't there, does the, co is, does the coalition for RBT still exist, which brings together um, both political parties and a number of other organizations. And yes, maybe, the, would you like to say something about that? Yeah, no, certainly the RBT coalition um, exists. Um, it's still in force and it's, it's a great tool to show to Congress that there is widespread support for this that it's not just um, the advocacy organizations like ACA and others who want RBT, that there are AmCHAMs um, that support this, uh, that there, there are you know, financial advisors, um, tax preparers who support this, um, that this is not a niche issue. Um, so yeah, no, it's still in force um, and people can go uh, and find that. I believe the website is rbtcoalition.org. And if you're an organization um, that's interested in joining and supporting that effort, um, we, we wholeheartedly, and I think uh, Rebecca would uh, second me on this, uh, you know, uh, encourage you to join. Oh, thank you. Uh, another question I had about just a, a detail in your presentation, Mary Louise, was uh, you mentioned there were 5.2 million Americans living abroad. Uh, and I've seen much higher figures. And I was going to ask where that figure came from. And, and is it is it accurate or is could the figure be much higher? No, we believe that our figure is very accurate. Um, as I said, we work with District Economics Group. If you want to find out how District Economics Group came around to that figure. There's a great webinar on our uh, homepage. I can send you the link to it later on, where he walks you through the data that um, was collected, how they matched that data, and how they how they got to 5.2. I think what you're referring to the the only other real number that's out there is the 9. Point million from the State Department. Now the State Department is collecting figures uh, for a whole lot of other reasons. Um, the, we have asked through a freedom of information request the methodology of how the State Department does that. And we, I think we're two or three years into that request. Um, we believe that they probably developed that figure um, and oftentimes in the past, they've said it's from registrations at embassies well, I registered at the Belgian embassy about, I don't know, 25 years ago. Um, 
I, nobody ever asked me to deregister, so I don't know if I'm still there. So they, they collect that from numerous sources. Um, they're also looking at evacuation issues, if they have to get all American families out of a particular country, and maybe those families include also some non-citizens. So we really believe that our figures get a lot closer um, to, the, to the actual number, but I really encourage you, if you wanna know the details on it, um, uh, listen to our webinar, and it actually mirrors what the FAP, the Federal Voting Assistance Program, estimates as the number of Americans overseas. Oh, thank you very much. Um, there are lots and lots of good questions. Some may be more for tax professionals, some are quite financial. Anya, I'm going to try you on a couple of them, see how you do. I know you're not a tax um, a CPA, but there's one here. If I renounce my U.S. citizenship, would I still receive social U.S. Social Security payments, or are they tied to citizenship status? Um, my understanding is that even if you're a non-U.S. citizen, you get to keep your Social Security benefits. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on Social Security benefits and citizenship, but I wonder if the ladies that we have with us on the panel have any experience with that. That's right. You, I mean, there are lots of people who have worked in the U.S. on a green card, for example, and they contributed to Social Security and then they moved back to the country that they're from. And uh, everybody, regardless of citizenship, if you contributed to Social Security, then you're entitled to your benefits. That's great. Thank you, thank you Rebecca. Um, here's one that the, the person, anonymous attendee who asked it, said it was for Anya. Um, if you only have rental income and possibly UK pension distributions, can you still invest in a Roth IRA? Oh, that's a great and a very common question. Generally, in order to um, contribute to an IRA or a Roth IRA, you need earned income. Generally, I would say rental in definitely pension income is considered passive income. Uh, rental income in most cases is also passive. So I would say it would be difficult unless uh, you're somehow qualifying that as a self-employment income. So I would definitely say that would be a great question for an accountant as far as the rental income part, uh, pension income. No, that's passive, so that doesn't qualify. But any earned income, wages, uh, salaries, self-employment income, uh, that's what uh, what counts as earned income, and that's part of the qualification for an IRA or a Roth IRA contribution. Thank you. I'm pretty sure rental income is considered passive income. So again, disclaimer, I'm a tax professional, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Um, then there's a couple of questions about in, in with RBT, how would that affect US-based investment income? And if you sold a primary residence abroad, I guess that's a capital gains tax question. These may be, again, questions for a, for an accountant. Does anyone have a view on those? Yeah, I wonder so, if Mary Louise wants to tackle that one. Yeah, so um, again, a lot of these particulars and how um, a, income stream would be taxed under RBT is really TBD when Congress starts to write legislation or look at legislation. But as my presentation said, income that is generated, earned in the United States would probably remain taxable to, to the United States. Any income that is earned generated in a foreign jurisdiction that is not linked to US economic activity would be excluded. That's kind of the, the basics of it. But until really legislation is written and uh, a lot of these issues are flushed out and that's why we need hearings because these kind of problems, these kinds of issues, what Americans overseas are actually dealing with on their everyday lives in terms of their investments, um, the Congress needs to hear that so that they can write the right kind of legislation that 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 addresses these issues. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Another social security question about renouncing in social security. Um, does a non-U.S. spouse lose spousal social security contributions if you renounce your own U.S. citizenship? I don't know. Yeah, that's a, it's a good technical <laughs> question. It's one for, uh, I think, uh, I don't even know if that's for a CPA would um, know that. So I think it'd be possible. That would be for your local federal benefits unit. Um, 
at your your nearest embassy would be able to answer that question. Thank you. That's great. Um, so uh, Lillian asks, is any legislation actually being developed in Congress currently? So I can take that question. Um, I don't know, Rebecca might um, can add on to it, but there have been um, Congressman Holding back in 2016 introduced a residence based taxation legislation, but it was basically just a framework to get a conversation started. It basically just laid out the principle of we're not going to, um, US will not have the right of taxation for income that's earned overseas. So it's, it's what in Congress is called a conversation starter. Um, it was meant to be introduced so that other congressional offices who were hearing about this issue, interested in this issue, come together and start to have a dialogue about it and in the hopes of having some hearings to really understand all the problems. Congressman Holding is no longer um, in office, so that legislation has not been reintroduced. Um, Congressman Beyer, uh, I'm probably going to get the year wrong, but I think he introduced um, in uh, 2018 or maybe 2019 um, a Tax Simplification for Americans Abroad Act. Um, and he's reintroduced that in several Congresses, um, and we, we will see if he'll introduce it into this Congress. That is a simplified filing. So it is a worksheet that would actually allow people who fall underneath the FEIE or, you know, who do not have really complicated tax filings to kind of do a worksheet and say, okay, that's it. I just have this one page pager. Um, and not this complicated, long uh, tax burden of, of filing. Um, Carolyn Maloney, who unfortunately is also um, not in Congress, this Congress, but she has introduced over the past couple of Congresses two bills, the um, Americans Abroad Commission, which is similar to having hearings, but it would bring a commission together to review these issues and also issues like Social Security, Medicare, citizenship issues. Um, and she also introduced a similar safe harbor or same country exemption legislation. Uh, I think that's called the Americans Abroad Financial Act, um, but I probably got the name wrong. Um, again, it was a safe harbor. It sort of mirrors ACA same country exemption where you're, if you're legitimately living in France, your local accounts in France are not reportable in FATCA. What's good about all these efforts is that it shows to Congress, once again, this is not a niche issue. This is not something that's not really happening. It's not really that big of a problem for people um, because it shows that there are other congressional offices interested enough to go and introduce um, legislation. I don't know, Rebecca might have a little more on that. If she... um, so on the Democrats abroad advocacy work on this front is that historically we had three different bills that we were pushing. Uh, so we had uh, the simplified filing bill um, from buyer's office and then we had the two Maloney bills uh, and essentially what we're looking at now is we're looking at combining those bills into one and um, adding any kind of additional areas that Congress would feel comfortable in terms of addressing at this point in time. And, and ideally introduce that as a bipartisan effort uh, because bipartisan is always better. It has a, a much better chance of it actually passing. Uh, but we're working with our allies on the Hill on like a combined Americans Abroad bill. Um, and uh, I, I don't currently have a timeline on on that, but I mean, we are hopefully going to introduce it before we are in Washington, D.C. in June. Uh, and we'll at, at the end of the day, it is in Congress's hands, not ours, but we are pushing and we are trying our best to try to introduce something because uh, my my take on conversations with um 
members of Congress and, and staff on the Hill is that most offices don't really seem to be very comfortable with the concept of residency-based taxation, but the offices who have had the time and who have explored and understand the whole raft of tax problems and financial access issues that Americans abroad experience, that's when they really start to get the full picture. And that's when they actually start to consider residency-based taxation, because we all know, we know <laughs> all the different pain points and they, but they don't necessarily know because they're not living abroad. And more often than not, we're working with congressional staff who have never been abroad before. So, you know, th this is a, another one of the issues uh, is that people just don't, the, the people that are writing the laws haven't spoken to or gone abroad themselves. So it's hard for them to understand the legislation that is really required to fix the problems that we're experiencing. So these are all, you know, typical barriers. There's there's really, I think the, the main thing I would say is that this work in terms of fixing the tax problems for Americans abroad, this is no different from any other advocacy issue that lots of different groups are lobbying Congress on on a daily basis. Our issues are no different from any other issues. The only difference is that we're all living abroad and we don't have the option to be able to march down to the office and knock on their door and talk to people face to face to get them to realize how serious this is. We have to employ different kinds of advocacy strategies in terms of of email, phone calls, Zoom calls, um, you know, going to Washington, D.C. In, in a trip is a really big ask for a lot of people. But I am asking people, and, and I would say everyone here is very welcome to join us in June uh, in order for our faces to be seen and for them to prioritize this and to get the, these issues fixed sooner rather than later. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And that answers another question because somebody asked if, uh, well, RBT is the, the sort of aspiration if, if what was sort of being done in smaller steps in the meantime that might be more sort of realisable uh, sooner. So that, that answers that too. Um, we're, we're on the hour. Um, there are lots of, there are some unanswered questions. Uh, some are, I think, for tax professionals and if they're specific sort of tax related detailed questions. Uh, that's probably a question for, for your tax professional. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to our panelists, uh, Rebecca Lammers from Democrats Abroad, Mary Louise Sarata from ACA. Um, go to their websites um, and sign up. And, and I think that's the key, isn't it? It's sort of um, being active, um, lobbying your representatives and supporting ACA um, and Anya as well from Dunhill Financial at dunhillfinancial.com. Um, if you have financial, non-tax, but financial advice questions as an expat, um, thank you all very much.